so many people. <laughs> uh, hello everyone, I am Manuela and please George over there to talk to the little today, today. So we both had a little day and we here at the job. We worked together uh, in central team for the past nine months, a year or so. So we try to help make our analysis life easier, to make our governance, custom tooling and scalability and quality. Today we're going to talk about how we how to decentralize our data transformation and specifically how we implement this here also using DBT. Well, why do we want to do this? Well, some context about the journey and what we really learned to talk about today's talk we probably have. When George joined in 2020, we had the best model team of about six people. DBT was probably just starting to be utilized. There were a lot of tickets in the backlog to be done, but our data was relatively manageable. In a sense, it was quite clear to all the people of data. Fast forward to today, our data needs to go exponentially, and that's where our team. We now have a data org of about 50 people that was still stretched. So let's have a quick look now how we divide the data org. So we here we are guys in chapters. A chapter is a collection of identical or very similar roles keywords. That provides structure and strategy control, so the job responsibility and the work. In this way it's easier to identify who is doing what, uh, how much time resources are needed, and uh, where the my helps. So our four chapters you can see there are related engineering and literature. Analytics engineering led by Tom, product analy analytics led by Kavya, and inside analytics led by Nina. Uh, it's important to mention that we still have a single data team and we work uh, working closely together uh, to move forward the success of the company. So now uh, let's talk a bit about the stack. So what you see here uh, is a very simple but effective diagram for we use on a daily basis. Um, we use a lot of GCP product here at Dojo, and uh, we did create a similar domain data warehouse. We use DBT then to do all our transformation right back to the query. And then Looker is our visualization tool that is sitting on top of the query as well. Uh, today's talk is focused, uh, as you might have understood, on DBT. So, for those of you who don't know what DBT is, please, so let me say you should. It's amazing to be on it here. So, uh, DBT is an open source common line tool that enables the data team uh, to transform their data using analytics engineering as practice. But what does this really mean? Basically, you will be ed editing your file locally using a code editor and then run project using the DBT common line interface. Uh, to start with it, you don't need much, you just need some basic of the terminal, SQL, of course, and um, a bit of Python is nice to have. But why DBT has been so good for us here at Dojo? So first of all, it takes a strain away from Looker. Uh, it can be light, be clear, and easy to explore. What you do is basically ingest table that are already ready uh, for reporting purposes, and that, uh, in a way, you will avoid too many joints with too many tables. On top of that, uh, you can, you will need to build the right table and write super complex SQL query on Looker. Let's say performance is definitely improved. On top of that, you get automatic lineage. So let's say if you don't have to run model A, you need to run model B, then just can apply DBT because you automatically detect your dependency graph as you could. It has very scalable testing functionality. So you can automatically run tests on your source table. Let's say you want to check if you feel the small value or if you have a duplicate ID, but you can also write custom tests on the table and what you're going to write. And finally, it gives analytics engineer a lot of autonomy to build a data model and actually produce the data table. One important note, though, is that DBT so far is only set up for all this benefit in a single repository. So, as the name of the suggests, we wanted to do a little bit more than that. So, now you must have a clear overview of how to stack our data team. As I mentioned earlier, we grew exponentially in no time. With such expansion, a lot of problems came to end. So first of all, we have some very complicated dependencies here. We have loads of data models. And some of the very end ones take data from many different sources and many different teams. 
It could be, for example, that the code you see in the pencil has been changed by a model at Rachel Tinko. Then I went to another problem, the scale of the hack. Uh, the execution of the hack depends on its containing class and their dependencies. So as you can imagine, we were dealing with long running time before all the things could be updated. That's not ideal, and it's not cheap either. Last but not least, lack of fear ecology. It's very hard to spot the owner of a certain data model when you think that that would over 2005 did. So, quite frustrating for us. It was, oh, sorry, I forgot to <laughs> move. <laughs> it was a bad time to find a solution for that. So the main way we try to solve this problem is uh, with a data mesh style approach. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of it, but for those who haven't, basically it's a relatively modern approach to the centralized domain ownership. Um, in the example you see here, a whole, like there are some of our tribes and the data mass they own. So with the centralizing the data, there is also a change in attitude. Basically, the data you produce became a problem. So as you can see here, some of the data produced by one tribe is utilized by other tribes. That means that the data produced by one team is now a product for the other one. With this approach, of course, more governance is required, but I'm not going to touch on this, George is going to touch on this later. For us, the transition to a data mesh approach came quite naturally because the business decided to move to a tribe and squad model. With this kind of structure, it came quite naturally. Basically, every tribe is responsible for everyone the so on people. They say that just our own experience, this can be implemented in any type of structure or some project. So, the interesting part, let's now have a look at our whole setup. So, does this image look familiar to any of you? So, this is how it looks like our whole lineage graph. Actually, it's not the whole lineage graph, there's a string of it as soon now as DBT dots allows. It was way bigger than that with all the 2,000 model needs. Quite crazy. So in this kind of scenario, a few regular failed at key stages because key failure would not work at all. So I'm going to report now, I actually realized scenario here. So we had several issues with tables that are generated from a data set that is stored in Google Sheet. Those tables were supposed to run a snapshot stage just before the plug they could run, actually run the kickoff. So this chart, I'm pretty sure many of you know it, this is like our dark shader, which is an airflow. So this was our dark with all the model in As you can imagine, the red box are the failure. And every time there is a red box, all the step after that are orange, which is it. So going back to our example, uh, our table in Google Sheet were running on the second stage snapshot. So let's have a look at the first five column, five different run. So, in this specific case, a simple data error, not compared by the internet, would cause the repeat run comment not to, tri to be triggered at all. So, none of our team were updated, literally none of them. So, sometimes this would fail crucial reporting, like end of the month report, reconciliation, revenue share. So, now we want to see a bit of the conversation with the stakeholder. And that's so how to straighten this a bit for the whole business and for us. <laughs> <laughs> so now on bar, let's see the case I have solved this problem to the Lina Mina solution. George, over to you.
So if you want an example of this, think of marketing and marketing analysts owning marketing data, and operations and operations analysts owning operations data. It allowed us to have more concise stacks with less interdependencies. So that stuff that the grandmother was talking about that was really business critical was no longer being as affected by those crappy upstream failures. And most importantly, it gave us a change of mindset to our analysts. So they were now trying to think with a more product led mindset of what they could be using is actually being used elsewhere as well. But with all these improvements came problems as well. The biggest problem that I'm going to talk about is the lack of disability. Uh, thinking back to my earlier example about marketing and operations, um, sometimes those two data worlds overlap, and one might have to rely on another. Um, in the data mesh style approach, it's imperative for marketing, if they're changing something, to know that operations relies on it, and to have the visibility that what if they're doing might mess things up for operations. We don't want that to happen. So, how do we do it? Can you all guess what our favourite TV show is yet? <laughs> um, many of you will know that PBT produces artifact files after every run it does. Um, for this project, we use two of them, the Graph GPickle and the Manifest JSON. Don't worry if you've not heard of them, I'll talk you through what they are now. So this is Star of a Manifest file. The Manifest is massive, um, it's many, many lines long. I uh, can't put it all into a slide. Um, it's basically a massive dictionary about everything in your DBT project. Uh, so every file, so every model, test, snapshot, sneed, sneed, that's the word, seed. Um, and every time you do pretty much any DBT command that involves the compiling step, um, it gets generated. Uh, it's a really, really useful resource that you can find a lot of uses for. We're actually going to only use one very tiny part of this, which is the compiled SQL for every single file in the repo. Um, yeah, that seemed really easy. That sounds easy enough to understand. The graph file, however, is not. If you open it in the text editor, it looks like this, um, which is not very useful. However, if you use a Python package called NetworkX, uh, in three lines of code, you can make a bit more sense of it. It looks kind of like that instead. Um, depending on how big your DBT repo is, um, all of these nodes on the graph are basically individual files. So, again, uh, no, uh, a seed, so right that time, uh, model, the tests, um, snapshot, whatever, and all of those lines indicate dependencies between the two nodes. So, in order to build model X and build model Y, there would be an edge between those two nodes. A simplified version of that is what you might see commonly in the DBT docs. This is obviously a lot smaller. Um, and we have here the source data, the trans transformation layers, and your exposure at the end as well. Um, and it's not pretty, it's got labels on it, so you can actually read which is what is what. Um, this is a working example of how we want our data mesh to work. So we have three repos here, you can actually write through it more than that, but say we have three repos. You've got presentation layer data in repos two and three, and that is working as a product for repo one. It gets ingested as a source data into that repository. So in that massive graph that we saw, the only bits of real interest that we're looking for when trying to join graphs together is where nodes look like this. So we have a source node in one repository, think of that as repo one in that previous diagram, and we have an output presentation layer node in another repository, and basically we've got to say that one depends on the other. That's pretty much it. And thankfully, NetworkX has a very handy little function to do that, which is that. All of about you know, 30 characters to have an edge. So once we found all of those matching nodes, we just got to add an edge in between all of them. And we have a global graph, which ends up looking something like that. So all of the different colors indicate different repositories. And somewhere in there, there are edges between two different colors, but I appreciate it's a bit too big to really see. So, we have global lineage. But, how does this actually functionally work? So, say I want to make a change to one of our repositories. Um, so I'm going to use this kit with that lovely hash. Um, some stuff happens. So we run dbt on the changes that have happened, and that produces those artifact files that I just spoke through. With that, we send those artifact files up to Kubernetes, 
where we host an API endpoint, and that endpoint also grabs the production artifacts from all the other repositories as well. With all of those artifacts, we can produce two things. One, a production global graph. This is a bit simpler than that million node thing I showed you earlier, uh, with just five nodes on it. And we can also produce a working graph as well. So that working graph is using the artifacts from our commit and the other production artifacts. From that, you probably guess, we can tell the difference. So here we've added this node at the bottom left, and we can see the dependencies all the way through. And if we think of different colors, then we would see that that does affect another repository. Why do we do that? One of the biggest use cases is in our CI checks, making sure that they're as effective as possible. So, say I want to make this change. Seems fairly harmless on the outset of it. I'm just renaming a field that was PK to be event ID. But will that have any knock-on breakages in other repositories? Testing this in isolation is fine, like the table will still run, it's still created by the table, but will it break something anywhere else? This is what we need to test for. We could run everything downstream, but that's a bit of a crap idea, because we end up in exactly the same position we were in before, where we're just running absolutely everything, enormous tags, takes forever, and people complain enough as it is that things take a long time, so this would be even worse. Another thing we could do is just run one layer downstream of a modified table. But this has one particular problem, which is select star. So we can't stop around this one, select star. Uh, I write it all the time as well. Um, but you can, in theory, have that PK field just mask as select star, infinite layers through, and 20 layers down the line, you say select PK, and it will be there. So it requires some thought as to what we should actually do about it. And that was a select style macro. So rather than style, we actually list out every single field in a table. Um, that would be a pain in the ass to write. I'm sure none of you would actually love to do that. So a macro for it is our solution. What this does is, this is how it looks from just calling the macro. So you just you list the source table. It looks at the information schema for that table, grabs all the columns in it, and basically just puts them into a string, loops through them, and puts them into a select statement. Ultimately, what we want to do is test to see if our source schema has changed enough to break our code. So we can do that with a compiled SQL, which I spoke about about five minutes ago, we get from the manifest. And we can take that compiled SQL from our select style macro and it will tell us if something is broken enough. So, thinking back to our earlier example where I was committing a change of PK to event ID, here we've taken the table that we built in our CI process and you can see we're listing out all of the columns. But because we're removing PK and adding event ID, this will now break. Um, and just a dry run of that SQL. Will tell us that that's broken. Um, and that would obviously be an error on our CI process. And know that if that was marketing changing that, that would break stuff for operations and they'd be very upset. This is actually a working example, and hopefully you can see it. I'll let it play. That's some really cool stuff, I can guarantee. Um, yeah, I was pressing that. Anyway, very neatly you would see it looping through all of the stuff that's right and wrong in our repository. Locally, very soon, and also in our CRM process as well, so it helps handle this on both sides. That's right, now I need to see. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to 
The only other thing to say is obviously we're in a great position now, so we can test for schema changes on tables um, and know when that's going to break stuff elsewhere. There's still some more stuff that we want to do with this lineage tool, and it's only in its infancy, it's only going to get better as well. But essentially, um, it would be great to link this to our monitoring service so we can see that if this thing is broken, it also has this impact everywhere else as well, which is coming very, very soon. Um, for now, though, I'm going to leave it on this slide, which is actually going to be my next slide anyway, um, which is that we are hiring, we have open roles, there's a QR code here, you can scan, um, and our ton of person, Dave, is also here as well, you can talk to him if you're interested. But that is it, thank you for listening.